to the Action Podcast. Here's your host, my dad. Well, here we are, launching Season 3 of the Experience Emerge, or XM for short, podcast. If you're listening to us for the first time, thank you and welcome. My name is Matthew Kanabi. I'm a licensed mental health therapist, and I work at a ministry in Akron, Ohio called Emerge. And beyond seeing clients, I also get to host this little production that discusses issues and topics around mental health and our faith. For those of you who have been following us for a while, thank you. We are looking forward to a very exciting new season with some great guests and some really interesting topics. This marks our 46th episode. I can barely believe it, to be honest. We have been listened to from so many countries around the world, and our listening base continuously grows with each episode. So thank you for sharing and reposting our show. Uh, So today I am very excited to share with you a part one of a two-part series that we recorded. Our guest and I were introduced last summer over a Zoom call where I got to hear her passion and love for God and also helping others with issues regarding mental health. Since then, she and I have texted and emailed and had a few phone conversations, and I really think the world of her and her work. She has written a wonderful book called Restoring Relationship, which I have read and definitely recommend, and she is here with us today. Please welcome to the XM Podcast, Molly LaCroix. So I am a marriage and family therapist, and I was trained at, I got my master's in marriage and family therapy at a seminary. And so I've always integrated, um, you know, Christian spirituality, theology, Bible, um, as, as I have learned what are all out there, secular models of psychotherapy, different ways that we can help people heal. And uh, in the course of, um, well, fairly early on in my career, my primary interest became um, helping people heal those deep wounds Mm-hmm. from trauma or what I like to call adversity. Um, some of us can readily identify that we've suffered trauma, but many of us might dismiss what we've experienced. Well, well, it, you know, it wasn't traumatic, but all of us have experienced adversity. And so, and those are the things that really, um, that both wound us deeply and then provoke all these adaptive strategies uh, that we adopt to survive it, to move forward. Yeah, I, I I really like that idea. I mean, I think we talk a lot of in the clinical world about the small T versus the big T, but I think sometimes maybe to clients, I think a, a word like adversity um, is maybe a little bit more palatable being that sometimes when we hear the idea of trauma, then it, it means it has to be such an extreme event that right. I don't fit into that category. So therefore I don't carry wounds. I don't carry, and we're going to get in, you and I are going to get into the nitty gritty of all of that. Uh, tell me a little bit about your journey into um, IFS specifically. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, let me back up so that, so that the listeners know IFS is the therapy that um, uh, Molly and I've talked about, and I, I've done podcasts on before it's internal family systems. And um, it's something that I think Molly has done an amazing job of being able to communicate. And um, she actually uh, put it in a book that we're going to be talking about, uh, Restoring Relationship, that really takes this model, integrates it into a faith-based understanding and perspective. So talk to me a little bit about your journey connecting with IFS, and then we'll talk about IFS for a little bit. Sure. Yeah, well, so my interest in healing deeper wounds led me to EMDR, and I know um, you've talked about EMDR on your podcast as well. Um, at the time, I was in Southern California, and there are a lot of EMDR therapists in Southern California. Yeah. And so I got trained. I was using that modality. I became a consultant, helping other people learn it. So I was all in, um, but I, I, I felt like something was missing with my clients, and um, when Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, which is a tremendous resource uh, for anybody. <laughs> not an e- I got to be honest, it's not an easy read. It is, it is a, it's a trauma, like, but I think it's a brilliant book. And I, yeah. when I read yeah, it. It's, I it's like, a heavy topic. It is a heavy topic. It is not heavy. light reading. However, he is a good writer. Very so good. unlike some other people you might read, you think, I just can't wade through this. He is a good writer at any rate. 
you know, he he is the world renowned trauma specialist and and writes about that in the first half of the book. So the impact of trauma and in the second half of the book, all the different ways to treat it. And so there was this chapter on IFS and I'd been exposed to IFS briefly in graduate school, but by people who didn't really understand it. And so I dismissed it fairly quickly. Um, and when I came back to it after many years of working with clients in terms of healing their deep wounds, I just thought, this is it. This is exactly what I see every day. And in those days, unlike now, I, I could just say, oh, I want to go get trained. And I went and got trained. And um, I have a tendency to be all in when I do things. So I there are three levels of training in IFS. I've done them all. <laughs> um, I'm certified. I have uh, I spent three years in Richard Schwartz's personal consultation group, and uh, he is the founder of IFS. So I've had and I've been to workshops with him as well. So um, I have marinated in yeah. this model. You're, you're not dabbling in <laughs> IFS. Dabbling. You, you went right into the deep end and took the deep dive. So yeah. um, I think that's great. And I, I, I'm very similar to you. You know, I spend a lot of time um, doing EMDR, which I still use. But I found um, with EMDR, and, and maybe you can speak to this, is that there were times where we would get locked, where we would get blocked. And we were going after a specific memory, a trauma, an experience. And what would happen is a part would show up and shut the system down. Now, I just used language that I didn't have at the time. And I thought, well, I, what do we do now? Because we're, we're going after this part, or I, I don't want to keep using IFS language, but we're going after this specific memory, but the system's not letting us get there. And right. so I remember then going, that can't be it. Yeah. Well, I think it's fair to say, because I was in the MDR community for many years, um, that the standard protocol is very robust. The research is there. It, it works. Yeah. But what what we have found over the years is that standard protocol has to be encompassed in a in a broader um, therapeutic process mm -hmm. um, because that protocol takes you directly into trauma. And as you said, our systems are um, and this is where we'll start getting into internal family systems language, but our systems are wired to keep us safe, mm -hmm. keep us alive. And it is a threat to the system to take someone back to a traumatic memory. And so the system says, whoa, 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 whoa. And so it is necessary. And there are, you know, obviously a lot of EMDR therapists out there doing very good work. They've all figured out how to create safety for the system. And there are a lot of different ways to do that. But without that, the system is not going to give you access to that traumatic material. Yeah. So let's go there. Let's let's start talking then about what this, what this means and what IFS is and, and why this modality, why this therapy uh, really connected with you and, and uh, unpack it, tease it out a little bit. Okay. So... We've been talking about the fact that we all carry wounds. You know, we live in a fallen world. Inevitably, we experience something that wounds us. And the nature of our, you know, the, the context we're in has a, has a lot to do with how profound that wound is. Um, so, for, for example, most people do not get through school without being shamed by either a teacher or a coach, some other authority figure. Mm -hmm. And if they experience that and they have people who can help them process it, it doesn't get stuck. But a lot of us have experiences like that. And because shame makes us want to hide, we don't even share it with, even if there are safe people to share it with, we don't share it. So it gets stuck. Mm -hmm. So we have these wounds. Now I'm going to back up for a second and talk about one of the primary one of the most important things about the internal family systems model, which is the view that as humans, we are multiple. Mm -hmm. We have, and it is, I believe, how God created us. We worship a God who is multiple. Mm -hmm. We are created in God's image. And so it is no surprise that when we turn our attention inside, we notice different parts of ourselves. Right. And one of the most common things that we say to ourselves is when we're up against a decision. 
well, part of me really wants to quit my job and be an entrepreneur. Another part of me is terrified that I won't be able to pay the bills. Uh, my family will starve, you know, and, and a, a decision that significant, we might hear from four or five different parts of us. But, but that is really common language. And the developer of this model was just listening to people talk about themselves, you know, and, and saying, oh, well, listen to this. You know, there's a part that wants to do this or a part that wants to do that. Yeah. So we come into this world with different parts of ourselves. We have, we also possess characteristics, qualities that reflect God's image. And we can think of that as being our soul in the IFS model. It's called self, which isn't a, you know, for lack of a better term, really, but it's the leader. I like to think of it as the leader of the family. You know, so if you think again of this, this model is called internal family systems, so we have a family inside of us. And like any family, a, a well-functioning family requires leadership. Mm-hmm. As, and that's true internally. So we have a leader and then we have parts of ourselves. So, okay, going back to where we started, something bad happens. We have a difficult experience. And a part of us carries a wound as a result. And those wounds can be distorted beliefs about ourselves Like, oh, that happened. That means I'm unlovable. I'm unworthy. I'm stupid, whatever it might be. We carry intense emotions like shame, panic, grief. We have images of scenes where these things happened. We carry sensations in our body. We might have impulses to do certain things. So all, all of these different Um, these are all the different ways these burdens manifest. And a burdened part of our internal family is a threat because, you know, the the common language we all use is things trigger these these wounds and then they surface. And, And that's, you know, that's dangerous to the system. And so we adapt to the wounding by having other parts of the system take on protective roles. So you stop me, Matt, if you need to. Like, no, I, I think. Okay. I, 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 I just, just, <laughs> I, yeah, please do, because I, I, I think it's it's great to be able to put it into these terms, because sometimes as you and you and I had a, a conversation yesterday, there are times when if we were just to throw this out there, it sounds nonsensical. But the way yeah. that you're able to communicate it right now, I think that most people who are listening can recognize that there has been many times in their life where a part of them has been pulling them in one direction and then another part was going in another direction. And what you're doing is you're now creating a a little bit of a a language and understanding so that we can communicate these things. I I know, I, I think I shared with you when IFS was introduced to me, I felt like Neo in the matrix, like the first time, like I knew it existed. I just didn't understand it and I couldn't see it. And it was swimming around in my head. And then all of a sudden IFS was explained to me and I was like, I get it now. I understand that I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a therapist, I'm a musician. I, all of these parts of me are working together, but they're not exactly like the same part. It's like different aspects of me. And that's when the system's working in a, um, a unity. But when it becomes maladaptive is when we start to have the problem. So maybe you can start to talk about then when these parts aren't working together. Correct. Yeah. And I really appreciate you're making the point. Again, we come into this world, parts are not bad. That's they right. are wonderful. They reflect all these different qualities that make us who we uniquely are. But then life happens. Some become wounded and others take on protective roles to protect the system from the impact of that wounding. Okay. And so there are fundamentally two different kinds of protectors. One group are proactive. Like they, we call them managers because they are trying to manage the way other people perceive us. So they are the ones that help us be organized and show up to work on time and get stuff done and, you know, fulfill responsibilities. They might care a lot about what we look like physically, what are our appearances, depending, you know, again, in the nature of our experiences and our wounding. So they're the, the proactive managers, they are trying to keep the pain from ever surfacing. The other group of protectors we call firefighters 
because the pain inevitably, we do get triggered. Stuff does surface. We have, we suddenly we're in a shame spiral maybe. And in comes our dedicated first responders to put out the fire. And so they're the reactive protectors and they want to stuff that pain back down and they will do what it takes. Just like a firefighter turns on the hose and does not care if all the furniture gets ruined, our dedicated firefighters will do what it takes to stuff the pain back down. Can you maybe talk about a little, like a few examples of maybe different firefighters that you've seen with clients, like parts that have shown up some of the examples of what a firefighter might be. Yeah. Well, one that I think people will really understand is a firefighter who uses um, substances or some kind of compulsive behavior to numb out or distract. Right. And so, um, because again, that's their primary intention is to disconnect you from the pain and various compulsive behaviors like gambling or pornography or, or binging or um, binging on food or binging on Netflix or, you know, whatever, um, certainly using substances, all of those, uh, they pretty much start out as firefighter behaviors. Now it gets a little complicated because they can morph into a kind of a managerial I'm just going to do this to keep the pain from ever surfacing kind of thing. That's right. But but another what might surprise people is if you think about a firefighter could be a shamer. So let's say you say something that provokes shame in me and my system starts flooding with shame. I might have a reactive firefighter who shames you right back. Just like a viper gets the the claws are out, the fangs are out, and they're going to go strike somebody else. Mm -hmm. So that can happen in say with among couples. Mm -hmm. So in your intimate partnership, you know, someone says something, you go into shame and you strike back. And that's very much, you can feel the reactivity in that kind of behavior. And that's our clue that it's more of that. Ooh, I'm going to numb my pain by hurting you. You know, I think that's a really good point. And I hear this a lot is that um, I I try to help clients recognize that reactionary part of them when something happens and it's not something that you're premeditating thinking it's the reactionary part that comes up. Notice that. And let's, let's, let's try to understand what that part's role is versus being a responder, which is taking in information, processing that, maybe allowing the Holy Spirit to sit with that. I think the firefighter really starts coming out in that. I don't even know why I respond that way because I don't really feel that way. You know, Mm -hmm. I think sometimes in in a marriage situation like that, it's argument happens and I'm going to say whatever I can to hurt you because I need you to get away from me. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's how we, you know, our parts ping off each other. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And that is a, that's classic, you know, firefighter. I don't know how that happened because it comes, it isn't something we sit back and think about doing. It's a reaction. What we're doing right now is in understanding IFS, these are a few of the parts that show up. Talk to me about what we're protecting. They're fundamentally, they're protecting anything vulnerable. You know, the term we use in the model for the vulnerable parts of our system is exiles Mm -hmm. because the goal of the protectors is to exile them. Mm -hmm. One of the analogies we use is, you know, locking them in the basement of the family house. So this is an internal family. The the protectors and and the other parts of the system get to be upstairs and those little exiles are downstairs. And, and I say little because a lot of times they are younger parts of us. We are much more vulnerable to taking on responsibility for adversity when we're young because our brains are simply very underdeveloped. It takes human brains a long time to fully develop. And young children fundamentally are about survival. And in order to survive, the good people need to be the ones taking care of them those adults in their lives. And if something bad happens, particularly at the hands of one of those uh, caregivers, the young child by default says, it's because of me. I'm bad. I'm stupid. I'm unworthy. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say, and I think it's important for us to recognize is that through the journey of life, there are parts of us that inevitably will become wounded. It's just a part of being born into a fallen, broken world. Right. And then what happens is these other parts come up to kind of protect 
the wounded part, maybe sometimes push it down, but their job is to um, literally protect it. So I think we've got to look at protectors in a way that they're trying to do something good, even right. though the way that they do it sometimes is horrible, which yeah. is a hard thing to wrap our heads around. That's right. They have a positive intention. And yes, that behavior can be very dysfunctional. It can wreak havoc in your life. But if you begin to, to re recognize that they mean well, that they're doing this because they feel like they have no choice. And as you, as you get into relationship with them, they will tell you that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be doing this, but I don't have a choice because the pain is too threatening. Mm -hmm. So they mean well. And it's like the thing I like to say, too, is these protectors were never meant to do these jobs. So, for example, a, a very, very common protector, maybe almost universal, is the inner critic. Mm -hmm. So most of us have a protector who criticizes us to proactively try to avoid someone else criticizing us. Right. They, they weren't born that way. They take on the job often again. It happens early in life. Let's say you're shamed in the classroom or on the athletic field. And this part says, oh, never again. That will never happen to me again. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, here comes the criticism to try to control us to avoid further shame. Yeah. So this part with with time and attention and a healing of the underlying wounds, it can take off that uniform it put on and and regain what it was always meant to be, which maybe is more like an advisor. Right. You know, it's great to have a part of the system that says, oh, hang on, don't don't leave the house yet. You you know, you didn't brush your hair or your, you know, <laughs> whatever. Right. Um, you forgot to finish that that task that you need to do, but in a gentle, flexible way, not in a harsh and belittling way. Yeah, it's been interesting when I, I've worked with clients that we've been able to access uh, maybe a manager or a firefighter, and that firefighter is doing a role because they think they have to, but they don't really, they never started out wanting to do that. And it's almost like an unburdening of that part versus not even getting to the exile yet, but getting to the firefighter of going, you know what? I've always wanted to be something that built the system up, mm -hmm. but because of this situation, I've had to tear everything down because we can't let you get to this part, which I think mm -hmm. is really fascinating because that in itself can be therapeutic, healing, cathartic. And we haven't even addressed the wound yet. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's so much value in, and, and we do, you know, you're sort of alluding to the fact that when we begin paying attention to what's going on inside ourselves, the first level that we encounter are almost always protectors. Right. And so um, we, we spend time with them and as we befriend them and they get to know the leader of the system. And, you know, I like to think about the leader of the system being in harmony with the Holy spirit. So there's this, you know, there's this lovely space we can create where the protectors finally get to tell their story. And fundamentally, parts telling their stories is what heals. And so they tell their story, they feel connection, they feel like they're listened to, and they begin to relax. And then again, that gives us safe access to the, the underlying wounds. Yeah. I recently finished your book, uh, Restoring Relationship, and, and you do an amazing job throughout the book going through this process, uh, you know, we're, we're going to spend a very small amount of time talking about this stuff. So I would encourage people to take it further in your book. I think it's important for us to recognize that one of the things that you wrote about in your book was talking about the idea that some of these protectors have no idea how old you are. So trusting the idea of the self, essentially the leader of the system, sometimes can be a scary thing from a, for a, a protector's perspective because the protector still sees you maybe as the seven-year-old being wounded. And, and right. part of that, that developing the family dynamic is allowing the maturity and the growth and the life experiences to be addressed with these other parts. Now I, I can hear myself talking and mm -hmm. I know the words that are coming out of my mouth and I'm sure people are listening and going, okay, is this like multiple personality disorder? Is it <laughs> like, what is happening with Matt who we've listened to on this podcast many, many <laughs> times before? Is he losing his mind? Talk to me a little bit about how we can make more sense of that than what I just said. 
Well, you know, of course, I understand what you were saying. I thought it made a lot of sense. But I also hear you that as a culture, we have pathologized the idea of multiplicity. And uh, sadly, um, right. and, and so that creates some fear for people, you know, that, that can be a, a roadblock to, um, to understanding themselves this way. But again, I go back to scripture. I go back to the fact that we're created in the image of God who is multiple. Now, our multiplicity is not like God's in the sense that all, all members of the Trinity are equal, but there is um, an analogy that Paul writes about if Christ is the head of the church, his body, and the body has diverse parts that have different functions. And, and so, you know, that to me is an analogy that more closely aligns with what we see inside ourselves. That's good. If this kind of way of understanding ourselves scares us, that's just a part of the system who's Mm -hmm. afraid. And we can start with that one. And we can say, tell me more. What's scary about that? You know, Paul himself says, you know, in in Romans 7, I don't know what I'm, you know, so I'm, this is paraphrasing, but I do what I don't want to do. And I hate what I do. You know, his, the inner conflict is, is right there. It's, it's common to all of us. And you know, God gave us an imagination that is, you know, you and I were talking yesterday about creativity. That's right. um, great creativity is, you know, core to who God is. God is the creator. Right. And again, bearing his image means we possess creativity. And I think of that in terms of the connection to our imagination mm-hmm. and how, you know, when we work with clients in this way and they just turn our, their attention and they begin to connect with a part of them that has been doing something and suddenly they're getting an image of it. Mm-hmm. And, and this is our imagination at work, yeah. um, you know, because from a neuro neurophysiological standpoint, what we're doing is we're connecting with neural networks. There are neural networks in our brain. That's how we function as humans. And when we connect with one of them, it's so fascinating to see how images can appear. Not always. Sometimes people will only feel parts in their bodies but often they get an image. They certainly hear from them. They'll hear their voice. I think it's, I think it's uh, fascinating how the brain works and how God created us and how in situations. And I think you and I talked about this as well yesterday, where a client will have grown up in a home that uh, divorce happened at seven or eight years old. And at seven or eight, they internalize that as it was my fault. I'm the reason they got divorced. But what happens is that we go back in, let's say they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s, or whatever, and we're reprocessing with the awareness and the ability and the creativity that they have now. And it's amazing how they're able to see that wound, see the exile, allow the exile to unburden himself because the perspective that the exile took was not correct. It wasn't in a uh, reality that was actually happening. But as seven years old, that's all we can see is the world just revolves around us. We don't see the bigger thing that's happening around us. But then what happens is they restore that memory similar to EMDR, and it's not as traumatizing as it was before, because all of a sudden it's like, well, it wasn't my fault. It's not carrying the same negative core belief. That's right. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was saying before is, you know, what I love and the reason for the title of my book is restoring relationship. And I didn't put S relationships because I was really focused on restoring relationship with ourselves. Yes. Makes sense. (laughs) Um, And um And so it is in in the relationship between the leader of this internal family, again, welcoming the spirit into this sacred space of connection with, say, an exile, this wounded part of the system. They get to tell their story. And we're not going to challenge that negative belief that they hold. We're going to let them tell the story. And when they tell that story in the presence of love and compassion, and and we can um, you know we can update them. They ultimately release that. They come to their own conclusion and recognizing that isn't true anymore. Like yeah. I don't believe that about myself anymore. And and so that's it's all relational. Yeah. So again, congruent with our our faith that is at the heart of it the great commandment to love God and one another as we love ourselves. And what is so powerful about this model is that as we develop relationships with these parts of ourselves and our protectors begin to relax and we are able to heal these little wounded ones, we are much more loving to others and our relationship with God is enriched. 
I want you to think about this for a minute. God asks us to love our neighbors as ourselves. I know a lot of people, if they love their neighbors as themselves, probably wouldn't have very many friends. There's so many good points and ideas that Molly had shared with us in our first half of this interview. Please look out for the conclusion coming out soon. Visit mollylacroix.com for more info about her and how to find her book, Restoring Relationship. Thank you for entering into yet another season of the EXM Podcast. We truly appreciate you and your support. For more information about Emerge Ministries, visit emerge.org. And come find us on all social media platforms. Thank you for listening. And until next time, or when our Savior comes, God bless.